Good morning, everyone, and what welcome. On behalf of NAMI, Cape Cod and Islands, NAMI on Nantucket, and in partnership with Nantucket's Alliance for Substance Abuse Prevention, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Stuart Ablon today as our guest speaker. Founding director of Think Kids in the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital, Dr. Ablon imparts a revolutionary approach to better understanding and resolving challenging behaviors while building the skills necessary to maintain mental health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Ablon. Thank you very much. Do I need this? I guess I need this. Um, is it working? <laughs> OK, two good answers. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you all? Great. Wow, all right. <laughs> that's impressive. I mean, it is Saturday, so that's a good I mean, look, you're here on a rainy, cold Saturday morning on Nantucket in April. I mean, wow, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine that. Uh, thanks to NAMI, which uh, thank you for, for bringing me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your excitement this morning. I appreciate the exuberance, um, and it is, uh, it is great to be here. So um, thank you for, for having me. Um, I have about an hour or so with you all to do sort of a once around the world of um, our work and our approach. And then I have some uh, colleagues who are going to be joining from uh, different walks of life on the island here, uh, supporting kids and families for a, a uh, panel discussion. So um, if you have questions as I go here, just um, write them down, hold on to them, because we're going to have plenty of time to discuss with the whole panel. Um, after, uh, after my remarks. Sound good? Yes. All right, good. Y'all ready to go then? Yes. Excellent. All right, so as you heard, um, I am here to talk about challenging behavior, how to understand it, how to address it. And um, I I've spent 30 years now really uh, focused on that. And uh, in many ways, um, I would hope that 30 years later, we're in a much better place when it comes to understanding and addressing challenging behavior. But uh, I do have to say that 30 years later, challenging behavior is the number one reason for referral for mental health services. It is the number one concern that we parents bring to the pediatrician or the family practitioner's office that we're concerned about. And how many, how many folks here are working in uh, or representing our schools here on the island? Yeah, um, I, I'm sure you all will agree with this. It is the number one concern that educators have in our schools across the country and beyond now, inundated with challenging behavior. Um, and challenging behavior, really importantly, we need to understand is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to mental health issues. It is the first early warning signal. And most emerging research at this point shows us that most categories of, of mental health issues later in life can be traced back to, in the beginning, some signs of challenging or concerning behavior. And I should be clear, by the way, when I say challenging behavior, I mean everything from on one end of the spectrum 
uh, aggressive, oppositional, defiant behavior. But on the other end of the, uh, the spectrum of concerning behavior, things like withdrawal and avoidance and shutting down and things like that. Now, um, I would say um, there's some sort of good news, bad news in the, in the scenario of challenging behavior being the canary in the coal mine. The good news is actually it's a great opportunity for prevention and early intervention. Because when you see a child struggling with challenging or concerning behavior, something is going on, okay? Kids don't exhibit challenging behavior in a chronic way for no reason. Something is going on, okay? The bad news, challenging behavior is still tragically misunderstood and mishandled. And I wish I could say it's just as bad as we miss an opportunity for effective early intervention or prevention. I actually think it's worse, honestly. I think we often make matters worse when there's an opportunity to make them better. And obviously, not intentionally. Now, when I say challenging behavior is still tragically misunderstood, why is that? I think it's because conventional wisdom dies hard, okay? Uh, and this graphic shows you here, right? The idea that the world is flat. Do you know how long people hold, held on to that idea after people tried to like step off the face of the earth and you couldn't? And after science disproved it, and if there are any Celtics fans, I hope there are here, you know who I'm talking about who still thinks the world is flat, right? Like people hold on to these ideas long after they've been disproven. Well, um, what is the conventional wisdom that people hold on to when it comes to challenging behavior? I, I sum it up this way. I think most people believe it's as simple as kids do well if they want to. In other words, kids behave well if they want to. So if a kid's not behaving well and you believe kids do well if they want to, you're going to believe the reason the kid isn't behaving well is because they don't. Want to. And if they don't want to, then what's our role going to be to try to what? Make them want to do well. And people are laughing because that seems ridiculous, right? <laughs> but think about what we do most of the time. As parents in our homes, as educators with traditional school discipline, clinical approaches, a lot of them are focused on trying to make kids want to do well, safe in the assumption that the reason they're not doing well is because they're sort of unmotivated to do so. And I, I want to avoid being too casual this morning with you all because, uh, you know, I'm not really exaggerating here. The, the conventional wisdom is basically that kids use their behavior in order to get stuff or get out of stuff. And when I say stuff, like, what do we think they try to get with their behavior sometimes? Like what? What's Attention. It? Attention, exactly. And what do we think they try to get out of? Trouble, going to school, work. And, and by the way, that's work, like getting down to work in school. But it's like chores at home. It's anything unpleasant, right? Okay. And we assume that, th in, other, in other words, their behavior is goal-oriented, right? It, it's uh, willful. It's sort of, in many cases, we describe it as manipulative, <laughs> right? Um, that they're trying to get and avoid things. And if you believe that, well, then it makes sense that we're going to use carrot and stick approaches to try to motivate them to behave better, right? Rewards, consequences, things like that. Basically to try to teach a kid, hey, you know what? If you behave poorly, it's not going to work out better for you. In fact, it's going to get worse. And if you do what we want, life's going to be easier for you here, okay? Again, I'm being pretty casual about it, but like let's say in our schools, when, we, uh, when a kid is really struggling with their behavior, what do we do? We do a functional analysis of behavior. People who, anybody here do FBAs or familiar with FBAs? You all? Yeah, and you have two choices generally where you can check well, what's the function of the behavior. Is the kid trying to get stuff or avoid stuff? So it's sort of built into our systems, okay? And at home we tend to believe these things as well. Now, I want to be very clear with you all here this morning. I'm not here to say you should never use a reward or consequence with a child ever. No, I'm not here to say that, okay? What I'm here to say is, I think we should be a bit smarter about it. I think we should use rewards, consequences, motivational procedures for things they're good at, things they're intended to work for. And I think we should not use them for things they were never intended to be used for. 
And this is my summary here, and, and, and I want to be clear, this is not my biased view, this is lifted right out of the psychology literature where we've studied extensively what we call um, contingency management systems or token economy systems, which are fancy ways of saying things like sticker charts and stuff like that, um, or point and level systems for older kids where we really try to be very systematic about motivating kids to behave better. And what does all that research show? What the research shows is that these things, rewards and punishments, stuff like that, they're good at some stuff and not good at other stuff, which is basically like any other intervention in the world. Um, good at some stuff, not good at other stuff. What are they good at? They're good at teaching kids basic lessons, like right versus wrong, do versus don't. And they're good at motivating kids from the outside, externally, to do those things we want them to do. Now, what does this mean? What this means is, if a kid is behaving poorly, because they're confused about what's on the list of do's and don'ts, or they just are not trying hard enough to do the things we want them to do, these things should work. Because you're like what I would call barking up the right therapeutic tree, okay? However, if the cause of the kid's challenging behavior is anything other than those two things, we shouldn't expect them to work. And by the way, we shouldn't blame them, it's not their fault. I mean, pe people sometimes um, say to me that I am too critical of traditional behavior management strategies. And I push back on that, because I say that that's not true. I'm not critical of them at all, actually. I'm critical of us using them for things they were never, ever, ever intended to be used for. And then being surprised when A, they don't work, <laughs> and B, they make matters worse. Now, what were they never intended to be used for? Well, they were never intended to help kids build complicated thinking skills. Just, just not, that's not their goal. They were also never intended to build helping relationships between adults and kids. Why is that? Well, even if the kid seems very into a sticker chart or something like that, let's be clear, when you use rewards and consequences, what you're doing is you're, you, you're leveraging the power differential that you have between you and the kid. You're using mechanisms of power or control to try to manipulate their behavior. And that's not the definition of a helping relationship, okay? And finally, and this one is really interesting to me, these things, rewards, consequences, stuff like that, they were never intended to help kids who have a hard time staying calm, stay calm. Okay, and if you wanna be, uh, if you wanna use like, you know, professional jargon for this, we could say they were never intended to help kids who have an activated stress response a tuned up stress response, stay calm in the midst of frustration. You wanna be more casual about it? You got a kid in your home, your classroom who goes from zero to 60 quick? These things were never intended to help with that. And I always say to people, <laughs> to me this is not like rocket science here. If a kid is starting to get upset and somebody comes up to them and says, if you keep acting this way, here's the consequence you're about to get. I mean, I don't know about you all, but like if I'm getting pissed off about something and somebody comes up to me and is like, hey, if you keep acting that way, life is about to get worse for you. I'm not like, oh wow, thank you. <laughs> no, seriously, that's so calming. Like here I was getting pissed off, but knowing my day is gonna get worse, thank you. That's really grounding. I feel so much better now. I, I, my cortex is now open for business. Let's talk, because now I'm in a reasonable place. Uh, no, our, us humans, you know, uh, uh, thinking and feeling for us humans is inversely related. The more we humans feel, the less clearly we think. And by the way, that is not an advertisement for don't feel. Feeling's great. And by the way, feeling tells us when there's a problem. Feelings don't solve problems, though. Okay? You have to, at some point, damp down the feeling so thinking can rise to the fore. And when a kid is getting flooded by feeling and we remind them they're about to get hit by a consequence or lose a privilege, all that does is throws more emotional fuel on the fire, okay? Now, so what I would ask you is, who comes out on a Saturday morning to hear a talk about challenging behavior? People who are around kids who are just confused about what the difference is between right and wrong and aren't trying hard enough to behave well, or, Kids are really struggling with some skills. In some cases, seem to have some basic mistrust of relationships with people in power, and who have a very hard time staying calm in the midst of frustration. Because if it's those kids we're talking about, reward and consequence programs will not be effective. And they actually might make matters worse. 
And when I say might make matters worse, I want to point to two things this morning with you all. One, there have been thousands of studies that have shown this. I am not exaggerating at all, thousands. The more you use a carrot on a stick, a tangible reinforcer to try to get a kid to do something, what happens to that kid's internal drive to achieve the goal you want them to achieve? Anybody know? It goes down. And not just a little, folks, a lot. There's a strong negative correlation between the use of external reinforcers and the development of internal drive. What I mean by this is when you use reinforcers, external reinforcers, to try to get kids to do stuff, they will become much more motivated to get the stuff. They actually get less motivated to accomplish what we want them to accomplish which is really sad, right? <laughs> and as like educators, parents, I mean, it, you, the sort of the holy grail for us, the thing we're most interested in is sparking internal drive in kids. The last thing you want to do is something that's going to damage that. And you all know what this is like too, because if you overuse rewards with kids, it, you sort of like, you know, constantly feel like you're bribing them to do stuff. You ask them to do stuff and they look at you and they're like, what are you going to give me? And that pisses us off, right? We're like, you trying to hold me hostage now, right? And we got to look in the mirror because guess where the kid got that problem solving strategy from? You know, if we're constantly saying, we'll give you this, if you do this, we shouldn't be surprised when we say to them, will you do this? And they say, well, what are you going to give me? It's a case of you reap what you sow, okay? Now, having said that, I will tell you that uh, I get more concerned, by the way, about another side effect, even worse than internal drive which is the impact on kids' self-esteem, okay? And I, I um, brought something that a kid I work with in the Boston Public Schools wrote for me. This kid was, um, uh, uh, they, they were using a sticker chart to try to motivate her to behave better. Uh, she was not working. She was feeling miserable. It was awful. She doesn't do a lot of, um, of talking to me directly about this stuff, but she will write things to me, um, and she'll draw. Um, and... Here's what she wrote. She said, my brain is idiotic. I make stupid mistakes. I mess everything up. I always make a mess and get hurt and ruin everything. And that's a kid we're trying to motivate to behave better. How we miss the mark with these kids. And I don't mean to start off on a depressing note here on a Saturday morning, but we got to realize what the impact of these interventions are. And the way I like to explain this to people is, um, actually my grandfather who um, passed away a couple of years ago um, at 105, um, amazing, right? Uh, my grandmother, I, I just visited her with my youngest uh, last weekend, yeah, last weekend, she's 106. <laughs> or 106 and a half, actually. Um, <laughs> they, were, they were married for 80 years. I know, right? Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, but my grandfather grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, and moved his way around the US. What he saw in his 100 plus years was uh, wild. But, um, but anyways, uh, he had all these great grandfatherly sayings. And uh, one of them that he used to say to me all his time, had so much wisdom in it, he would say, uh, you know what, Stuart? He'd say, if you give a dog a name, eventually they'll answer to it. If you give a dog a name, eventually they'll answer to it. And what I finally realized is this applies to my work. Because if you treat a kid like they're lazy, unmotivated, don't care, aren't trying hard enough, we should not be surprised when over time, guess what? They start to look like and talk like and act like a kid who's lazy, unmotivated, doesn't care, isn't trying hard enough. And I want to be very clear that I don't think any of us here would ever try to intentionally make a kid feel that way. But we've got to look ourselves in the mirror because with every reward or consequence we send a kid's way, we're sending them the not-so-subtle message that we smart adults are supposed to know what's going on. We think at least part of the problem is they're not trying hard enough. Or else why would we be trying to motivate them? So it's a dangerous message to send unless we're sure that what's going on here is they're not trying hard enough. And honestly, that flies in the face of 40 years of research at this point. 
40 years of research on kids who exhibit a lot of concerning behavior. What has it shown? Well, it's shown what we almost always find out, and that is conventional wisdom is wrong. The idea that kids do well if they want to, if they're not doing well, we just got to make them want to, that's been disproven, folks. And the, one of the big ideas I want to share with you this morning is that kids who struggle with their behavior, they don't lack the will to behave well. On the contrary, what they lack are the skills to behave well. Our human behavior is determined much more by skill than will. And when I say 40 years of research, what I mean by that is, if every one of you, for instance, nominated a, a kid that you're here thinking about today, whether that's your own child, a child you teach, treat, support, you name it, who's struggling with their behavior, and you also nominated a peer of theirs who's rather well behaved. And when I hop on the ferry to go back to Boston, let's say I took them all back with me, some of you are like, can you please? I uh, uh, took them all back to Mass General with me and gave them all neuropsychological evaluations. You know, you would find huge differences in the neuropsychological profiles between the well-behaved kids and the kids struggling with their behavior. What you would find is the kids who struggle with their behavior, they struggle with skills in areas like flexibility, frustration tolerance, and problem solving. Okay? They have a lag in development of skills. Now, is, by the way, is there ever a time where all kids tend to behave pretty poorly? Like at a certain age or something? What would you say? Where behavior is not their strong suit? Yeah, two. Yeah. two, right? What do, you actually, what do we call it when two-year-olds? Terrible twos. Terrible twos, right? And is that because they are terrible, evil little beings when they're two? <laughs> Some people are like, yeah. Um, <laughs> it feels that way um, at times. Having I get three myself, um, it, it does feel that way. But no, they're not evil little beings. You know what they are? They're terrible at this stuff. They're horribly inflexible. They have terrible frustration tolerance. They have extremely limited problem solving skills. But here's the good news. Most four-year-olds are more flexible than two-year-olds. Most 10-year-olds have better frustration tolerance than six-year-olds. Most 17-year-olds have better problem solving skills than eight year olds. But you notice the language that I'm using? Most. In your homes, in your schools, in your programs, you have eight year olds with three year old flexibility. You have 15 year olds with seven year old frustration tolerance. I'm just making these numbers up. You have 22 year olds with 10 year old problem solving skills. And by the way, to make it even trickier, and I'll touch upon this in a little bit, the average Neurotypically developing eight-year-old does not have eight-year-old flexibility skills at this moment in time. They tend to have five or six-year-old skills. Thanks to the pandemic, your average 14-year-old tends to have 12-year-old frustration tolerance skills, and so on and so on. Now, let me be slightly more specific here because I know I've got some folks uh, here from uh, programs and agencies that uh, bring a lot of clinical know-how to the mix here. Um, so I just want to go a little deeper than summarizing the skills we're talking about, because when I, I mentioned that research, uh, our research at Mass General, other people's research, has really shown that when kids struggle to manage their behavior, or honestly, when anybody struggles to manage their behavior, it's because they're struggling with skills in one or more, often more, of five areas. And here they are language and communication skills. This is very clear, this is one of the reasons two-year-olds we call terrible twos. You know, they, they're not very good at using language to let us know what's bothering them, engage in a back and forth, et cetera. Um, but don't be surprised when you run into 17-year-olds with language and communication difficulties that are a big part of their difficulty regulating their behavior. Attention and working memory skills, especially important in places like schools, but frankly, all problem solving <laughs> requires good attention and working memory skills. Emotion and self-regulation skills. And, and don't be uh, tripped up by the jargon here. Um, uh, uh, you know, the word regulate, all it means is to manage or control, right? So what are we talking about? Your ability to manage your emotions, like your emotional response to frustration, and your ability to manage yourself. Uh, what's perhaps the most important self-regulation skill to keep in mind? Impulse control which is literally our ability to think about the likely consequences of our actions 
before we act and change. And I always tell people, if you want to know how important impulse control is, after this morning together when you all leave, as you go through the rest of your day, imagine what the world would be like if you did or said the first thing that came to your mind throughout the course of the day. <laughs> You'll amuse yourself a lot. Not just you, everybody. Don't pretend. Everybody here will amuse yourself because your first impulse is not a good one typically. Okay? We humans spend a lot of time inhibiting our impulses. You know, two-year-olds don't. They're like, I see that. I want it. What am I going to do? Take it. Grab it. I think something. I'm saying it. Right? Thankfully, most of us adults don't do that. Okay? Um, but some kids, they don't develop those impulse control skills the same way that we would expect. And here's the sad irony. Impulsive kids do stuff they shouldn't do. They then get consequenced. You know why that's sadly ironic? Guess what consequences require to be effective? Good impulse control. Because right before you're going to like hit your peer in school, you need to be like, you know what, if I hit him, I'm probably going to lose recess like I did last Tuesday. And I'm not really wild about that. So I don't think I'm going to hit him. I think I'm going to do something else instead. In other words, you have to have the impulse control in the moment for the consequence to be meaningful and accessible. Sadly ironic, because who gets all the consequences? Kids who don't have the impulse control to actually make use of them. Category four, cognitive flexibility. Fancy way of saying flexible thinking. I'm sure you all here, many of you are thinking about kids today who are what I call the rigid, concrete, literal, black and white thinkers stuck in our gray world. Uh, when everything goes according to plan, rules, routine, these kids are good. But if there's any change, ambiguity, uncertainty, unpredictable stuff, tough. And finally, social thinking skills. And this is everything from basics, like how do I start a conversation with somebody? to more complicated things like how do I know how I come across, how my behavior impacts others, um, to empathy, one of the most complicated social thinking skills. And I guarantee if you're thinking about a kid who's struggling with their behavior, you will find them somewhere on this list. And what I tell people is if you start thinking about this list, if this is the lens through which you look at challenging behavior, you'll start to be very good at doing an assessment at spotting where the difficulties are. And let me, uh, let me give you an example from a kid that um, I uh, did a consultation for recently, just to show you how in very brief interactions, if you think skill not well, and think about these five categories, you can do like a mini neuropsychological evaluation yourself and figure out where the challenges are. So this is a kid who um, has been given her, uh, her foster parents and her school quite the run for her money with the, for their money with her behavior. She, um, she shows up at the office with her foster mom. I go out to meet her, and first thing I notice about her is she's got a really cool outfit on, um, mostly because she's got a big straw hat on, and she has about, it must have been seemed like about 50 beaded necklaces wrapped around the hat, but many of them then are draping down like this. Uh, all around her head, but in, also in front of her face. So you know those beaded curtains that you have to sort of go like this? It was like a beaded curtain for her face. Um, so I was just trying to, oh, oh I also know she's um, holding this book tightly to her chest. And I said, uh, I said, you know, I sort of got down on one knee, so a lot shorter than me. I said, hey, nice to meet you. Um, I said, I, I, I love your outfit. And um, she says, thanks. And I was like, I especially love your hat. I was like, thank you. I said, did you, um, did you make the, the, the necklaces? She said, every one of them. I was like, well, they're really cool. She's like, thank you. I'm like, all right, we're off to a good start. Um, and then I said to her, um, and uh, is, is that your, uh, your diary? Because it looked just like a diary that my daughter used to have. I'm like, is that your diary? And her whole demeanor changes. And she looks at me and she says, no. I was like, oh, oh uh, it's not your diary. No. Uh, I said, so, so what is it? And she's like, a book? I was like, oh, OK. W what kind of a book? And she looks at me, and she's like, a book I write stuff in? <laughs> I was like, oh, what kind of stuff do you write in it? Private stuff. <laughs> oh. Um, and <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, sounds like a diary, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I say to her, I'm like, sounds like a diary. 
And she looks at me stone cold and she says, it doesn't have a lock. <laughs> it doesn't have a lock. And I'm like, but, but you write private stuff in it. And she's like, well, private songs. I was like, oh, interesting, songs. And, and she's like, yeah, I just wrote one. I was like, oh, just now? She's like, well, a little bit ago. She's, and she's like, um, you want to know what it's called? I was like, definitely. She says, mad. I was like, oh. And I promise I'm not embellishing this one bit, she says to me. She's like, do you want to hear it? I was like, definitely. And she looks at me and she says, it's eight and a half minutes long. <laughs> and don't interrupt me. <laughs> I love these kids. Um, so at that point, you know, this is all in the waiting room, by the way. So I decide we should probably like go into my office now. Um, and she sings me the song without looking at her book that isn't a diary. Um, she sings it by heart. And I, I looked at my watch. I timed it. It was like eight minutes and 20 seconds. OK. So if you, by the way, if you take out the eight minutes and 20 seconds, um, even just from that little interaction, if you start thinking through these five categories, uh, can anybody think of an area here that appears to be a real area of strength for this girl? What do you think? Working memory. Working memory, you got it. Any others? Language, language and communication. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe not what we would call the social pragmatics of language, but language and communication. Okay, what's your bet on the area that she seems to struggle a lot in? I hear a bunch of cognitive flexibility. Where do you all get that from? Why do you know that she struggles with cognitive flexibility? She had a definition for what a diary is. A private book that you write private stuff in is not a diary unless it has a lock. Rigid, concrete, literal thinking. Okay, and where else do you see challenges, perhaps? Social thing. Where do you get that from? Well, if you think someone's going to want to listen to a poem or song you wrote right now, <laughs> you're going to have a hard life. <laughs> yeah, if you think somebody's going to want to sit down and listen to your song for eight and a half minutes, you're, you're missing something there. And it's probably not going to help if you tell them, and don't interrupt me. <laughs> right? Uh, so social thinking difficulties. And any other nominations for places that may be challenging? Emotion regulation, right? What's the name of the song? Mad. Mad. Okay. So... My whole point is, you don't have to do a whole neuropsychological evaluation. You spend a few minutes with this kid, looking through this lens, and all of a sudden you're like, she's got some strengths, like most kids I know, and she's got some areas that I think are going to contribute to her challenging behavior. Now, one of the things you may be asking yourself is, okay, but so why do some kids struggle in these areas and other kids not? Okay? Um, is it nature or is it nurture? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Always. It's both. But one of the things we know for sure, since we've been able to image the brain, is there is nothing like exposure to chronic stress, what some call toxic stress or trauma, to impact brain development. And this is just a crude example of a neurotypical, otherwise healthy developing toddler's brain in the scanner asked to do something, and then a toddler who's been subject to a bunch of uh, toxic stress and uh, neglect in their life, and look what you see. You don't have to be a neurobiologist, right, to see the massive differences here in what's lighting up in the scanner. And by the way, these parts of the brain that are not lighting up in the scanner, what do they do for us humans? These things. So there's a lot of talk in our schools and our programs about being trauma-informed, being trauma-sensitive, um, which I'm thrilled to hear, but I can't tell you how much it drives me nuts when people tell me, well, we've had all this great trauma-informed training. And let, let me, can I show you our behavior contracts we have and see what you think of them? Because mm -hmm. those two things are completely incompatible. Because if you're really being trauma-informed, what you realize is exposure to chronic stress and trauma, what does it do? It delays brain development. And what does that do? It manifests itself as lags in skills in these areas. And what does that manifest itself as? Challenging behavior. Challenging behavior is the downstream impact of exposure, chronic, exposure to chronic stress and trauma. OK? Now, I'm just going to get up on the soapbox for a moment here because I've written a lot about this. What I find is what's happening out there is we've got all these kids who have been exposed to all this stress and trauma in their lives, and they're walking into our schools and other places with lots of lagging skills and exhibiting a lot of challenging behavior. And then what we do is we respond with punitive discipline. 
And what does that punitive discipline do? It increases stress. So what does that do? It makes it harder for skills to develop. What does that do? It escalates the challenging behavior. How do we respond to escalating challenging behavior? By upping the ante on the punitive discipline, which adds stress, further gets in the way of skill development, around and around you go. I actually think this is a pretty good graphic description of what people often refer to as the school to prison pipeline as well. Now again, I'm actually not here <laughs> to, to, to share depressing news. I actually think what I'm here to share is very optimistic because while well, there, there are so many kids and families who are overwhelmed with chronic stress and trauma, so there's so many skills deficits and so much challenging behavior out there, this folks, we have entire control over. We do not have to respond with punitive discipline. We can do something else. And the something else I'm gonna broadly refer to as relational discipline. Discipline that doesn't rely on power and control, but instead on relationship. And don't worry if that sounds mushy, it's not. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you exactly what it looks like. But we teach a particular form of relational discipline. We call it collaborative problem solving. There are other forms as well. Our research, other people's research, what has it shown? That when you respond with relational discipline, not only do you not increase stress, you decrease stress. Not only do you not get in the way of skill development, you can help build skills. And of course, when you have less stressed people with better skills, what do you have? Less challenging behavior. And the cool thing is it can become a positive cycle because when you have less challenging behavior, it's a hell of a lot easier to respond in relational ways instead of punitive ways. Because I hate to say it, but I'm gonna be blunt with you all. One of the primary reasons we respond with punitive discipline when we know it doesn't work that well is because of our own adult dysregulation. Dysregulation is contagious. And when a kid gets dysregulated, we get dysregulated. We go right there with them and we get pissed off. And when we're pissed off, we seek power control. When we feel disrespected, unsafe, like we're not being treated like an authority figure, we reach for power and control to try to regain our balance, which ironically doesn't do that but we can do something else. So when I say this is actually a positive message, the reason it's positive, is if this is about skill, not will, it's good news, because skills can be built, folks. And in fact, we've learned a tremendous amount how you do that, about how you do that. So with that as background, I'm gonna transition to, okay, what does this look like in practice? And if you're saying to yourself, geez, why do you take a half an hour to get there, <laughs> right? Like half the time to tell the background? Because I think the thinking behind this is more than half the battle. I think one of the most important things you can take with you from today isn't so much the techniques, it's the thinking. And what I'm gonna suggest to you, a way of remaining in that mindset of skill not will, is to try to move away from the notion of kids do well if they want to, and try to embrace a philosophy that sounds like this. Kids do well if they can. What kids do well if they can says is if a kid could do well, they would do well. Why would a kid choose to do poorly if they had the skills to do well? I mean, I've never met a kid who prefers doing poorly. All kids want to do well. And we have almost a half a century of research at this point that shows when they're not doing well, it's about skill, not will. Let's hold on to that, okay? Now with that mindset in place, now let's get specific, okay? Um, and since we have some school folks here, I'm just gonna add one piece, which is, um, you know, in schools I talked about doing FBAs and things like that. Um, you know, in schools we think a lot about the ABCs of behavior. Um, a stands for, anybody know? And B and C consequence, right? And we examine the antecedents that are leading to the behavior, and then we use a consequence to write it, reshape the behavior. In our approach, we're still interested in the antecedents that lead to that behavior. It's the consequences that we're not so interested in, because we think that we're already missing something, which is the missing link between antecedent and behavior. The only reason the antecedent is an antecedent that leads to the behavior is because of skills that a child is having a hard time with. So in other words, if the kid had the skills to handle the antecedent well, they would and there wouldn't be a challenging behavior. The only time there's a challenging behavior is when the kid's having a hard time applying skills necessary to handle the antecedent. So in our approach, we're still interested in the A, Bs, but not the Cs. I like to think of it as sort of like the A, B, Ts. 
It's antecedent behavior and the missing link, the thinking skills that the child's having a hard time applying in that moment. But again, notice how that all flows from the philosophy. You don't get there unless you think to yourself, this is about skill, not will. Okay. Now, um, real quick. Um, somebody asked me recently, when do I think all this stuff from the pandemic is going to sort of settle down and uh, we'll, we'll get sort of back to where we were before? And I gave them an answer that they didn't like, which is I think that the pandemic will have generational impacts. And it is the explanation for why, you know, we used to get called to work with schools, like a school, like Nantucket High School people would call us and say, we've got 15% of our student body that are really struggling with challenging behavior, we really need help with them. It's about 40 to 50% of the average student body at this point is exhibiting some kind of challenging behavior. Why is that? Well, because when life is going well, here's what educators, parents do really well, which is that they set expectations for a kid developmentally right above their skill level so that they have to stretch a little to meet your expectations. Because stretching a little is actually how you help kids develop new skills. Now this is a, a, actually, anytime you talk about me or anybody else talks about skill development, let's be clear what I'm talking about is changing the brain. When you have a new skill, you've built new neuronal pathways in the brain, okay? And a basic principle of what we call neuroplasticity, changing the brain, is there has to be stress. The brain has to be stressed to actually change, to create, to develop new skills. You have to stress the brain, but it's what neurobiologists call good stress. Little, tolerable, predictable doses of stress. If the d stress is, the doses are too large, too unpredictable, too uncontrolled, that's where you actually, that's what happens with exposure to trauma, for instance, and that's where you have an activated stress response as a result. What you're trying to do is just give kids little predictable doses of stress that makes them stretch a little. And when that happens, they develop new skills, and then you set your expectations a little higher, and when they get good at meeting those, their skill level gets higher. And so for the educators here, it's like when you start the year, you say, hey, welcome to fifth grade. It's a little harder than fourth grade. Um, but don't worry, you know, we're going to help you, we'll scaffold this, you'll stretch, some things will be tough, but we'll get you there, and by the end of the year, end of the year you know what, guess what, uh, you saw they got fifth grade skills, um, and get ready, because sixth grade is going to be a little harder, so we're going to make you stretch a little bit, and on and on and on we go. That's when life is good, okay? Um, here's where challenging behavior happens. It's when the expectations are out of reach to a kid's skills, okay? Because challenging behavior happens in the gap between skill expectations and skills. And in the pandemic, what happened is expectations keep marching along. We didn't press pause and say, okay, you know what? You sort of lost a couple of years of learning there despite heroic efforts from teachers and others. Uh, you know, this wasn't a rich relational environment to learn it. So we lost a bunch of time. Let's reset the clock. No, we kept marching along even though skills didn't march along with them. So the gap was created. And for some kids and families, not only did their skills not grow, but they were all also exposed to all kinds of stress, trauma, loss, skills regressed. And so kids who didn't have that gap before now have the gap. That's why you're seeing so many kids with challenging behavior. Kids who had the gap may have actually had that gap widen even more, which is why their behaviors escalated even more. Make sense? Okay, so now let's get back to what to do. One of the things I like about our, our approach, we call it collaborative problem solving, is I think we do a pretty good job of taking complicated stuff and trying to make it simple. So here's complicated, ready? Pick any problem any one of you can think about right now with a kid that again, you raise, teach, help, work with. Any kid, anything they're doing you wish they weren't or not doing you wish they were, any problem. And what I'm going to tell you is, at the end of the day, you only have three options for how to respond to that. Only three. Doesn't matter what the problem is, kid. In fact, with any human, you only have three possible uh, responses to a problem. And in this approach, we just give them labels so we can talk about them with y'all, and you can talk about them with each other. We call it plan A when you try to impose your will to make a kid do what you want them to do. And whether you do that harshly or nicely, if at the end of the day you're just trying to make them do what you want them to do, we call that plan A. 
We call it plan B when you try to solve a problem together with a kid. And we call it plan C when you decide, you know what, I'm going to drop this for now. Or I'll solve it the way the kid wants it solved. OK? Not forever, but just for now. And believe it or not, folks, those are the only three options you got. <clears throat> now let me ask you all, of these three options, when a, you, we have a problem as adults with a kid, what is the most popular adult response to a problem with a kid? We usually lead with plan what? A, a the runaway leader. OK? Now, wouldn't you hope that the reason we're so fond of plan A is because it is so remarkably effective at the things that we care about the most? Now, let's walk through this together. I, I since I've only got a little time with you all, I, made, I, I took the liberty of making this list as, a, as opposed to asking you. It's a list of what most adults care about <laughs> when faced with challenging behavior with kids. And here's the list. We care about getting our expectations met. We care about reducing the challenging behavior. We care about helping the kid build the skills that they're lacking that's causing the challenging behavior. We care about not waking up to see that problem again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And we care about, thankfully, having talked to tons of parents and educators and everybody else, we do care about building a helping relationship with our kids. Because most people I talk to are very clear that if you're not in the business of building a helping relationship, good luck on the other goals. And by the way, let me sneak in one other tiny piece of research fact here. Um, one of the most important findings from social science research is when you try to help somebody change their behavior, there's only one reliable predictor of whether you're going to do that successfully. And thankfully, it's the most powerful predictor, too. The only reliable and most uh, powerful predictor of whether you can help somebody change their behavior is the degree of helping relationship between helper and helpy. The most powerful agent of change. And that's been shown by thousands of studies as well. So do, do you all think this is a pretty good list of goals to have? So like try to get our expectations met, reduce challenging behavior, help the kids build the skills that they're struggling with, solve problems so the Groundhog Day effect isn't happening, and build a helping relationship upon which the whole thing rests. What do you think? Pretty good? OK. So here's what I want you to do with me now. We're going to go through and, and see how the three options, plan A, B, and C, do with these goals. I want you all to just answer my questions out loud by saying yes, no, or maybe. So first question, plan A, when you try to impose your will to make a kid do what you want them to do, is that a way to try to get your expectations met? Yes. Is it a way to try to get your expectations met? Yeah. yeah, that's why it's so popular. That's why you all said, yes, yeah, plan A is the most popular. Why is it? Because we want to get our expectations met. And by the way, for good reason. They're good expectations. OK? Now, the reason I think I heard a couple no's in there is, does it always get our expectations met? Not foolproof, but it's an attempt. OK, how does plan A, imposing your will, do it reducing challenging behavior? What do you think? I see lots of head shakings. And in fact, what can it do? Make it Escalate it. OK. Um, how does um, plan A do it building skills in those areas that I talked about before? OK. How about how does it do it solving a problem so you're not waking up to see it the next day? And how does it do it building a helping relationship? What a fascinating indictment of our most popular response to problems with kids. <laughs> OK? Uh, now let's talk plan C. This is when you decide, I'm going to drop it for now. Not forever, but for now. Handle it the way the kid wants it handled. Is that a way to get your expectation met? No, because you're deciding to drop it. Is it a way, if you drop something that leads to challenging behavior, or handle it the kid's way, is that a way to reduce challenging behavior? Yeah. 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 OK. Is it a way to build skills, though? No. Is it a way to solve a problem so when you try to pursue it again, it's not there? No, and is it a way to build a helping relationship? Maybe. Oh, interesting. OK, I agree. Um, I'd say somewhere in between. It's not really a helping relationship because you haven't solved anything yet. But you are improving the climate of the relationship by not imposing your will. OK, so interestingly, plan A is a way to get our expectations matter to try, but it's not foolproof, but it comes with a bunch of downsides. Plan C is a way to calm things down, but it's not working on the other stuff. Let's talk plan B, when you try to solve a problem together with a kid. Is that a way to try to get your expectations met? 
Um, is it a way to reduce challenging behavior? Is it a way to help a kid practice and build skills? Is it a way to try to solve a problem so it doesn't keep coming up? And is it a way to build a helping relationship? Fascinating. OK. And by the way, I was um, in Hyannis on Tuesday um, working with uh, officers uh, uh, in some of the Cape uh, Police Departments, as I do from time to time with NAMI. They filled this out the exact same way that you did, which is, by the way, the same way the Head Start teachers fill it out, which is the same way that correctional officers fill it out. Um, everybody fills it out the same way. What is this telling us? Um, <laughs> we probably should do less plan A. We should probably use plan C in places to calm things down, but here's where the action's at. Now, I don't want people walking out of here, though, thinking, so we got to do plan B all the time. It's impossible. Okay, you have to pick your spots. The reason this is helpful is if you only have three options and you're not doing plan B yet, what are your two other options? A or C. How do you decide which to use? Well, it depends what you care about. Do you care about trying to get your expectation met come hell or high water? Could get ugly, but do you care? You want to get your expectation met? Or would you prefer to keep the kid calm even if your expectation doesn't get met? Now, I will tell you the reason I'm stressing this is most um, families I work with, where they have, uh, it's a two-parent family or multiple adults uh, supporting the kid in the, in the house, or in schools, uh, where you've got lots of adults or uh, in programs, what I typically see is what I call the AC split, where one person or one group of people are the plan Ayers, and one person or one group are the plan Cers. Okay, and here's what, like, uh, you know, if I'm talking to a family, for instance, uh, or if I'm in the staff room with people in the school, and I catch the plan Ayers, and I sort of ask them about why they do plan A. They'll say this. They'll be like, because you got to hold these kids accountable for something around here. No, I mean, seriously, how are these kids going to like take responsibility for their actions? Right? But if you talk to the plan seers, when the heirs are not around, the plan seers will be like, if it weren't for us, there'd never be any calm in this place because we're the only people keeping these kids calm. <laughs> right? Uh, and having had this discussion with a million families and schools, what's interesting is what I can say to plan, it's, it's great because what I say to the plan heirs is I'm like, you know, you're absolutely right. You've got to hold kids accountable. They need to take responsibility for their actions. And they'll be like, damn straight, <laughs> right? But then you can say, but plan Sears, you're absolutely right because if you don't keep things calm, you're not going to work on anything. And they'll be like, told you so. <laughs> um, but that's where I get to say the important thing, which is, so y'all are both right, but guess what? <laughs> Um, plan B is not the average of A and C. So a lot of A and a lot of C is not going to get B. There is a way to hold a kid accountable and keep them calm at the same time. That's called collaborative problem solving. But you're not going to get it by a lot of A and C. Okay? And it is a really important point because when people say to me, they say, you know, how are you going to hold kids accountable? I will be honest with you. What I say to them also is, I think administering consequences is the most lame way to hold somebody accountable. You it just, you just like show up for a detention or, or you, you receive a punishment. That's being held accountable? That's so lame. Like what's the ultimate form of taking responsibility or accountability is being on the hook to solve the problem so it doesn't happen again. The ultimate form of responsibility. And how do you do that? You collaborate to solve the problem. So it doesn't happen again, OK? So one of the things I hope you're seeing, though, here is these three plans, A, B, and C, are a way for us to basically say, OK, look, we've learned a lot about the brain. And one thing we know is that invoking power does not induce compliance. It induces dysregulation, which is escalation, shutting down. Sometimes it looks like it induces compliance, but the form of compliance it induces is what I call dissociative <laughs> compliance. What does that mean? Kid checks out, dissociates, and mostly what they think to themselves is, what the hell do I have to say to get this over with as quickly as possible? Which is why, by the way, you'll have conversations with kids about how they have to handle things differently next time, and they'll say things to you like, yeah, I know, I'm really sorry. You know, next time I'm going to really try to use my coping skills. And you'll be like, oh, wow, this is great, awesome, right? And there's not a snowball's chance in hell it's going to work. But they're just saying that to you because they're like, can we please get this over with, OK? Um, 
Invoking power is ultimately dysregulating. The nice thing is, you know what's regulating? Empathy. It's another one of the largest points I want to make today. One of the greatest human regulators we have is empathy. Okay? And we've learned an interesting thing studying the brain. And that is that the parts of the brain that are involved in language and communication, how we humans communicate with each other, are the same parts of the brain involved in regulation. What does that mean? Our words really matter. You can use words to dysregulate or regulate. And I tell people it's amazing. You know, obviously, there's so much about nonverbal communication. But you can be on the old-fashioned phone with somebody thousands of miles away, and what you say to them has the ability to change their heart rate, their blood pressure, for better or for worse. And by the way, I hope everybody has had some experience where you've been dysregulated and somebody has empathized with you, and it has regulated you. I tell people I had one recently, believe it or not, at the supermarket where I was grabbing my lunch in one of the, these places. Um, I don't, you, you don't have it here, I think, for better and for worse. But uh, you don't have Whole Foods here, right? Mm -hmm. No, we call it Whole Paycheck back home, um, uh, which is the reason it's good to not have it. Um, but uh, I was getting my lunch there. And you know they have those uh, things where you have like lots of little checkout counters, and they call you number eight and whatever. And I come over there, and I throw my stuff out uh, on the, the thing for the guy to bring it through. And I, I'm having a really bad day. And you know when people say to you, uh, hey, how's it going? Like, generally, you don't answer that honestly, right? You're just like, good, how are you? Right? Even if you're really shitty, you, you say, like, good. Pardon my language. Um, uh, that slipped out. But um, you, you, just, you, know, you just answer it, right? But on this day, I put my stuff down, having a really bad day, and he says, hey, how's it going? And you know what I said to him? I was like, pretty bad, actually. And he's, like, ringing my things through, and he stops. And he looks up. He takes a moment. He looks me in the eye. And he says, oh, man, I'm really sorry to hear that. And you know, I, I'm getting like, I, 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 I'm, like, I'm like getting regulated right here just recounting this story from Whole Foods. <laughs> right? And I looked at him, and I'm like, thanks. And he brings the rest of the stuff through, and he gives it to me, and he says, I hope your day gets better. I left more regulated from a 10-second interaction with somebody I'll never see again. Okay. Um, that's the power of words and empathy to regulate, okay? Um, I do a lot of work with a, a friend and colleague of mine who's a uh, well-known uh, trauma researcher. If, you are, uh, if that's an area of interest for yours, I hope you know his work, or if you don't, check it out, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry. And uh, he has this sort of uh, uh, rubric that he uses, and it goes like this. Uh, regulate, relate, reason. What he teaches people is you can't do those things out of order. You can't reason with a dysregulated person. You must regulate them first before they're going to be able to relate to you, in other words, hear what you're saying, before they're going to be able to reason with you. And too often with kids who exhibit challenging behavior, we try to go right to their cortex to reason with them. It doesn't work that way. Uh, information doesn't hit the smart part of our human brain first. If it did, we'd all be extinct. It hits the bottom of our brain first, and only if we're regulated and calm and feeling safe does it move up the brain to a place where we can relate to other people. And over if we're regulated and relating to someone, can we access the smart part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we can do some problem solving? Regulate, relate, reason, OK? Uh, and what's one of the best ways to regulate? Empathy. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways. And I share this because what I'm about to teach you, the ingredients of collaborative problem solving are a way to operationalize that. That's why Dr. Perry and I do so much work together, is our work operationalizes the principles he's teaching. He's teaching regulate, relate, reason. How do you do that? Here's how you do it. Three ingredients to this collaborative problem solving process. The first ingredient, no surprise, folks, what is it? Empathy. OK? Empathy. Empathy regulates. Only once you empathize with a child do you move to the second ingredient where you share your concern, which is when you're asking the child to relate to you. And only once you've empathized with them and they're relating to you, they're regulated and relating, do you move to the third ingredient where you are basically trying to reason with them. So 
Three ingredients, empathy, sharing your concern, collaborate. I'm gonna take you through them quickly. Um, first, let me say, uh, let me ask you a really stupid question to make a really important point. What is the worst time to try to solve a predictable problem with a child? When they're dysregulated, in other words, right when the problem's happening. So there's two different times to potentially do this collaborative problem solving. There's in the heat of the moment, we call that emergency collaborative problem solving, or proactively, and obviously proactively is the way to go. Because you can catch a kid when they're calm and accessible, not dysregulated, and you can be prepared for the conversation. Nothing like calm kid, prepared adult, for make for better problem solving. So let's talk these three ingredients, okay? Ingredient number one is most important and hardest, the empathy ingredient. But I, I wanna uh, put some meat on the bones of this ingredient. When I say empathy, my example in Whole Foods um, was fine because I wasn't terribly dysregulated and I was behaving fine. We needed the tiniest dose of empathy. But when you're doing collaborative problem solving, you often need to do a much better job of empathy. And here is where I would ask you to define the word empathy. It doesn't actually mean show you care. That's not the definition of empathy. Empathy, empathizing means to try to understand. Is that a way to show you care? Of course. But the goal is to try to understand. So I tell us adults in this first ingredient, think of yourself as a detective on an information gathering mission. Gathering information about what? Your child, the child's concern or perspective. You are trying to get to the bottom of what their concern or perspective is about the problem you're trying to solve. This is easier said than done, <laughs> okay? Uh, which is why I'm gonna give you a little guidance here. I suggest you start with a neutral observation. Say something like, hey, you know what, I've noticed that, or it seems like, or it looks as if, and then this is super important. Fill in the blank with the problem y'all are trying to solve together. Not the kid's challenging behavior, because then they're gonna think, wow, this smells like plan A. But the problem you're trying to solve, and then just ask for information, okay? Um, now, this can go awry really quickly. Like I, I was teaching this to a, uh, an educator in the North Shore of Massachusetts, a uh, really good guy, he's trying really hard. He, he went like this, ready? He said, hey, I've noticed that, so far, so good, right? And then he says, your behavior on recess is probably going to keep you inside again today. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> Kid was closed for business, right? Uh, so afterwards, I said to him, so, so what you, what's going on at recess? He's like, oh, they're playing this tag game. And like uh, this kid, uh, when he gets tagged, he's saying he wasn't tagged. People aren't tagging. They're pushing. And so then he goes and shoves other kids down, and he hurt this kid. And I'm like, okay, okay we got enough now. Because what do we do? We still go with the, hey, I've noticed that. But instead of your behavior, it goes, hey, you know what I've noticed that? Something about the tag game isn't working so great. What is it about the tag game? Can you fill me in? That's an old trick we clinicians call externalizing the problem. It's not about the kid or the behavior. It's about the situation. Hey, you know what? I've noticed there's something about the dinners that aren't going so great lately. What is it about dinner? OK? Um, as opposed to, I've noticed you've had a really hard time sitting at the table when we ask you to. What's going on with that? Because do we really expect the kid to be like, well, you know what? My sensory system is a little bit uh, off lately. Um, having a hard time modulating it, particularly at dinner time. Uh, not to mention, you know, my stimulants wearing off around then as well. So there's a little bit of rebound, as I've seen in the research literature. Uh, no. Um, so the point is, though, use the situation. Okay, and ask for information. And then this, in terms of uh, the slides I'm showing up here of doing this thing we call Plan B, this is probably the most important one, which is what do you do after you kick this off to try to get information? And the reason I say this is most important is I spent five years, I'm not kidding, trying to study when people do a good job of this first ingredient, what are they doing? And conversely, when it goes awry, doesn't work, we don't get information, kid gets upset, shuts down, what are they doing? And you know what I found? It's pretty simple. When it's going well, we adults do four things and four things only. And when it goes poorly, we're doing something other than those four. And what are the four? Again, not rock and science. They are information gathering stuff that any detective would do, like ask a question. And if you're not getting information, take a guess, an educated guess. And if at any point the kid seems to sort of escalate or shut down, you use one of these two calming tools. One is called reassurance. What does reassurance look like? It looks like saying things like, hey, it's okay, you're not in trouble. 
Or, I know there must be an important reason that, fill in the blank, like something about the tag game isn't going so great. Um, I'm sure there's an important reason, okay? Things like that are reassuring. And don't neglect this one, reflective listening. Whatever a kid communicates anything to you, communicating back to them that you heard what they said is regulating, okay? So in essence, all we adults do is toggle back and forth between these four things. Ask some questions. If you get information, reflect what you've heard. If you don't, take a guess or reassure them. And go back and forth until you say to yourself, you know what? I think I understand where they're coming from, what their concern, their perspective, their point of view is about this problem. And I don't know if anybody um, here, any, was anybody here uh, a Ted Lasso fan? Anybody watch mm -hmm. Ted Lasso? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Ted Lasso. But uh, he also gave some great advice. Um, here's a great piece of advice. Be curious, not judgmental. Now, he was actually quoting Walt Whitman, so I looked it up, and Walt Whitman never said this, um, which was part of his charm as well. Um, but the point is, this is great wisdom for the first ingredient of this process. Be curious, not judgmental. And remember, by the way, that empathy doesn't mean agreeing or disagreeing. It simply means understanding. Like when I was working in Hyannis on Tuesday, somebody asked me a great question. They were like, yeah, but you, you can't problem solve. You can't empathize with somebody who's like completely psychotic. And I told her, actually, I used to think that too until people started using collaborative problem solving in hospital settings with completely psychotic people and finding that they could regulate them by listening very hard to what they're saying, even if what they're saying is actually not in touch with reality. So you can do this. Still, even if somebody, uh, you know, you don't have to agree or disagree, you just have to understand, okay? The goal is to get a clear understanding of their concern, and they should be calm, more regulated, because empathy is regulating. Only once you have their concern on the table and they're regulated, do you move to the second ingredient, which is where we get to share our adult concern. Notice my words, concern, not solution to the problem. We adults have a hard time biting our tongue and not sharing the, our solution, especially because we've seen problems like this before, share your concern. I recommend the way you share your concern is by saying something like, and the thing is, or and what I'm worried about is, or and what's important to me. Notice what all those start with. They start with the word and instead of the word. Because what but says is, okay, I heard you, but my concern is going to trump yours. Okay? Say and because what you're reminding them of is their concern is just as important as yours. Okay, how do you know you're ready to move to the third ingredient? You have two sets of concerns on the table and they're still with you. Here, here's a nice little trick, by the way, to, to check if you're doing this right midstream. Ready? If you only have one set of concerns on the table and it's the adults, what plan are you headed for? One set and it's the child's? How do you know you're doing plan B? You must have both sets of concerns on the table. Can I have that last slide for a second? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, okay. the, way, the way you know you're headed for plan B is you have both sets of concerns on the table. And then you've done the hard work. You know, people try to race to the third ingredient. Don't do it. Put your time and energy into the first two ingredients. The third ingredient will be easy then. And the third ingredient is where you literally are now going to say, all right, let's collaborate to try to solve this problem. And I, I can give you some little scripts here. Um, I like to say to kids something like, hey, I wonder if there's a way, or I like optimistic versions, I bet there's something we can think of so that, and then you simply repeat the two sets of concerns. OK? Um, and one of the hardest things for us to do as adults, again, is to bite our tongue and give the kid first crack at solutions. And why do we want to give the kid first crack, you think? Empowering. Sharing of power, it's empowering. Well, I heard something else. An opportunity to practice skill. If they are struggling with problem solving skills, they're not going to learn them by just watching us do it. And by the way, what happens if they give you a horrendous idea? Uh, they're practicing, and I respond the same way. To all good, bad ideas or anything in, in between, I always say the same thing. I say, that's an idea. Let's think about it. And then you just put it through the litmus test. What's the litmus test? Does it work for you? Because we know what you care about, having spent some time understanding that. Does it work for us? Because we know what our concern is. Is it realistic and doable? Can we do it? 
and if we did it, would it cause any other problems? Walk them through that litmus test, okay? Now, let me just quickly give you an example of what this looks like. This is a um, uh, high school that I work with where um, a, a kid uh, has a lot of trouble, particularly transitioning from one class or one scenario to the next, and is often very disruptive at the beginning of class, but it takes on different shapes. Um, Actually, uh, just very quickly, one shape was, uh, they, they, uh, one teacher was saying well, you know, uh, she's often late to her class, but when she enters, she said her, her right of entry skills are very poor, which is jargon for like, have a hard time entering the room. And I was, I was like, well, can you explain what the right of entry skills, the poor right of entry skills looks like? And she's like, sure. I was like, well, tell me. She's like, well, you know, she'll arrive late. She usually flings the door open. I'm like, all right, that's a, not a great start. And then she'll look at the class and she'll be like, yo, bitches, I'm here. <laughs> I'm like, that's an example of poor right of entry skills. Uh, uh, but in another class, what she'll do is in her, uh, her science class, it's biology, um, they have do nows at the beginning of class, which you know, you know what do nows are, you're it's pretty self-explanatory, you're supposed to enter the class and do the do nows now, right? You all know. Um, so she doesn't enter and do the do nows, instead she walks around the back of the class distracting her classmates from doing the do nows. Okay, ready? Here's what proactive, not in the moment, collaborative problem solving looks like. Hey, you know what I've noticed? I've noticed that there's something about the do nows that isn't working so great for you. Can you fill me in? And because this is magic, she says, I don't know. <laughs> well, that was humor before, OK? Um, <laughs> it's not like you have the perfect words and she's going to fill you in completely. So she's like, I don't know. So what do you do? You got your four tools. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. I'm sure there's a good reason, reassurance, that there's something about the do nows that didn't work so great. Can you fill me in? I don't know. I just like, uh, like, when I come into your class, I'm like, I'm just feeling hype. Reflective listening opportunity. You come into class, you're feeling hype. This is verbatim how it went down. Um, uh, uh, forgive me, I'm sort of old. I don't really know what that means. Um, what do you mean you're feeling hype? Well, I'm like up. I got energy and stuff. So you're up and you come in class. I'm not sure what that has to do with the do nows, though, and why that isn't working so great. Well, because I don't want to sit down. Reflective listening, you don't want to sit down? Question, clarifying question, fill me in. Wh why don't you want to sit down? Well, because if I sit down, I'm going to like, lose my energy, and I'm going like, to get all like, sleepy, and I'm going to fall asleep. So wait, so you're moving around the back of the class because you don't want to lose your energy when you come in feeling hype because you don't want to sit down. If you sit down, you're going to fall asleep. Yeah, you don't want me falling asleep in class. You don't like that. Ah. Got it. I think I understand where you're coming from. Often there's a little bit of an epiphany if you do this first ingredient well. Move the second ingredient. And you know what the thing is? I'm just worried about if you're not doing the do now, you're not prepared for the rest of class, and sometimes you're getting in the way of your friends doing their do now. Um, I bet there's something we can do so that you're not losing your energy and falling asleep, and you're able to do the do-nows without getting in the way of other people doing their do-nows. Do you have any ideas? Um, her first idea, I'll, I'll just sit down and do the do-nows. Um, most people would be like, great, I love plan B. <laughs> um, what you really need to say is, that's an idea. Would that work for you? I don't think it would, because then you're going to get all tired and fall asleep. Let's keep thinking. Anybody here have an idea that might be more mutually satisfactory? What do you think? That's what they came up with, stand in the back of the room. Now, of course, the teacher was concerned. They were like, but what if everybody wants to stand in the back of the room? Um, what did you say? Uh, not everybody's going to want to do that. And by the way, not everybody needs to do that. Now, the teacher asked me, so but what if somebody asked me, like, hey, that's not fair. Why does she get to stand up? That's when you say, because it helps her and she needs to. And if you needed it, you would too. But you don't, so sit down. Uh, it's actually, believe it or not, that's not plan A. That's simply setting an expectation that that student is quite capable of meeting, which you're not going to drop. I mean, I put it this way in schools. Would you ever say to a kid, um, uh, you know, if you're giving extra help to a kid who's having a hard time decoding words and somebody else wants the same help, would you ever be like, um, you know, actually, you're right. I'm going to stop giving her help because, like, I don't want everybody here getting dyslexia. So, like, I'm, I, you know, I'm just not going to, you know, I can't give you the help that you need for fear of other people wanting that same help. Like, you would never do that, right? You're constantly individualizing. Okay. But back to my 
uh, little example. If she's got a standing desk, uh, she does it in the back of the room. Who wins in that scenario? Who loses? Expectation met? Problem solved. Relationship built. Aha. And here's the thing. This is not easy. I gave you a really quick example. This is hard. But the great thing about it is even when it's really rocky, skills are built and practiced. Embedded in the three ingredients of this process is a ton of skills training found across all five categories of skill that we walked through earlier. And what I love about this kind of skills training is the kid doesn't have to sign up for skills training. They don't have to admit that they struggle with certain skills. They don't have to be open to their mother helping them build those skills. All they have to be willing to do is solve a problem in a way that works out well for them too and smuggled in the back door is the skills training. My favorite finding from our research group is when adults practice this process repeatedly with kids, kids develop these skills. My second favorite finding, guess who else tends to develop these skills when they practice this? We adults, we get better at problem solving. We become more flexible, better perspective takers, better at empathizing. Very heartening, actually. It means you can change the adult brain. And the reason I'm describing this is I don't want anybody walking out of here thinking, OK, he is naive enough to think that he just taught us something that we're going to sit down and ask the kid for there. And they're going to say, oh, wow, thanks for listening to me. Let me fill you in. I have perfect words to describe what's happening. And then when you share your concern, wow, thank you. I'm thrilled to know your concern. I embrace it wholeheartedly. And now could we go forward with some problem solving? And yay, isn't this wonderful? No. The way it's going to go, it's going to be really hard to get their concern at the table. In some cases, because they think this is plan A. I mean, the moment you say, hey, can I talk to you about something? The kid's thinking, I'm in trouble. So it's going to be hard. And when you finally share your concern, guess what's going to happen? They may get upset or shut down because they think it's plan A. And you're going to have to go back to the first ingredient to re-regulate them. And then you'll come back here. And when you get to the third ingredient, you start brainstorming, your first solution may not work. But guess what? It's the back and forth and back and forth and around and around you go. That's where the skills are trained. Um, got a bunch of educators here as educators, you know. You're not successfully teaching skill only when a kid gets the, quote, right answer. It's the process, OK? And I hope you now see, having been introduced to these three ingredients, how they operationalize this sequence. In, in other words, they ensure that we honor how our human brains process information. The first ingredient is when you regulate a kid deep down in the brain. The second ingredient is when you say, hey, can we move up the brain? And can you understand my concern? And the third ingredient is when we say, OK, can I talk to your cortex? Let's do some problem solving. And if at any point in here they go brainstem on you and get upset, you just go back to the first ingredient to re-regulate them. Well, hold on a second. I, I, I heard you that you don't want to go to sleep when you come in and you're feeling all hype. We've got to work on that. I got it. But don't worry. You're not in trouble. That's important. We've got to make sure that that's working for you. And move back up the brain. Here's what I'm worried about. So do you think we can do some problem solving? It'll operationalize that. OK? And if anybody's here thinking, wait, you know, could I do this with any old kid too, not just a kid who's struggling? Of course. And guess what the benefit of that is for all kids? In schools, for instance, we call this social emotional learning. We call this as how you build future ready skills, OK? Um, which is why many schools use this as a whole school approach to try to build skills. All right, I'm going to wrap up in a sec here so we can get to our panel discussion. Uh, just a little evidence. Uh, th this is an evidence-based approach. This is an approach that is listed on multiple clearinghouses of evidence-based practices because there is a vast research literature supporting the effectiveness of this approach. What have we seen? We've implemented in schools, treatment programs, correctional facilities, in-home programs, hospitals, clinics, you name it. We see reductions in challenging behaviors and symptoms of a broad array of mental health challenges. We see dramatic need, uh, decrease in the need for punitive discipline. We see, for instance, dramatic decreases in teacher stress. We see kids and adults building skills. And not surprisingly, we see um, uh, kids much more satisfied with how they're being treated. Uh, just quickly, you know, schools right now are, are struggling perhaps the most with challenging behavior. 
Here's data from a district we work with in the Midwest, where during the pandemic, they saw a 143% increase in office referrals. This is pretty standard around the US. Um, during that same time, we implemented it in one elementary school as a pilot, they saw a 63% decrease. So a 200% delta. Um, and uh, you know, all kinds of other uh, findings in, in schools that, uh, that we see. All right, I'm gonna wrap up by just uh, giving you some resources for if you wanna learn more uh, before we transition to, to the panel discussion. But, but I, I also wanna remind people that, again, more than half the battle is rethinking challenging behavior. It's the lens through which you look at things. Uh, our program at Mass General is called Think Kids. Um, we have tons of resources for parents, for educators, for clinicians all at thinkkids.org. We now offer our entire training continuum remotely so that you can uh, you know, take it from anywhere. Uh, we have asynchronous options, live options. You can just go to the website, watch Plan B in action with real parents and real kids and real educators and real students. Uh, a lot of resources there. And if you're looking to find me, you can find me um, on my website uh, or uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter or stuff like that as well. Um, if you're a reader and want to learn a little bit more about what I shared today, there's a number of books that we've written about this. Um, if you're interested in what this looks like in homes, I'd suggest uh, Changeable. Uh, if you're interested in, in schools, I suggest our curriculum for schools. And for people who are trying to implement this system-wide, there's a, a book on system-wide implementation. Oh, and these two are available by audiobook if you prefer listening to, to stuff. Uh, and if you just want one-stop shopping, you can, uh, you can use this uh, this. What do they call these things? Thank you. I'm like ancient. I'm like, this barcode. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Let, let, let me, let me uh, finish my remarks by saying this. Um, I, I sense some excitement here about these ideas, which I'm thrilled about. Um, and I just want to caution people that when you head out in the world, uh, outside of here, this focus that we've had, uh, others may be less excited if you try to share this with them, okay? And uh, you may find yourself in, in, in the position that this gentleman did here. Um, he says, sometimes I think the collaborative process would work better without you. <laughs> um, uh, and I want to share a piece of wisdom that it took me about, I don't know, probably five to seven years to learn early in my career because I'm so passionate about this stuff. Uh, but it's really important, and that is, you can't use plan A to get you or someone, to get someone to do plan B. Okay, that, I meant to say your colleague, but it could be anybody. You can't use plan A to get people to do plan B. Okay, as much as you might like to. I mean, I tried. You can't impose collaborative problem solving on people. If somebody's not seeing it the same way you are, you know what I suggest you do? Listen hard to them. And then ask them to listen to you. And then invite them to the table. And if they say to you, oh, you're using plan B on me, that's when you say to them, no, I'm not, because you can't use plan B on someone. You can use plan A on someone, which I'm trying not to do, but you have to do plan B with someone. And if you're asking whether I'm really trying to understand where you're coming from in hopes that you're gonna do the same with me so we can put our heads together, sure, call it what you will, but yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to do. My point being, some of the most important collaborative problem solving that goes on to help kids is with no kid around. It's the adult caretakers, it's the educators, it's the people who are supporting the kid, collaborating with one another. Lastly, I'm gonna take you back to the beginning, okay? Um, hold on tight to this philosophy, folks. Kids do well if they can. If they could, they would. Um, but you know what? <laughs> uh, parents here, guess what? This goes for us too. Parents do well if they can too. As parents, we're all doing the best we can. Nobody wants to have their kid really struggling with their behavior. And of course, this applies to educators as well. You know what? Teachers do well if they can. Teachers are doing the absolute best they can to handle enormous challenges, okay? So ultimately, what I'll sort of leave you with before our panel here is the notion that people do well if they can. And you can apply this to yourself as well. Okay, the reality is we're all doing the best we can to handle what the world is throwing at us with the skills we are able to apply in the moment. Some of us are having to handle a lot more than others. 
Some of us are struggling more to apply skills than others. But be kind to yourself and others out there because the folks who are handling the most are also the folks who are going to have the most difficulty applying skills because it's hardest to apply skills when you're really faced with a lot of challenges. So remember, people do well if they can. Um, thanks for uh, letting me share all this work with you. I wanted to make sure we had at least a half an hour here for panel discussion and Q&A, so I want to invite my colleagues up here um, for our discussion. Actually, I think we're going to have some introductions first, um, but thank you all for, uh, for sitting and listening to, to my portion here. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart, for um, that amazing talk. I think I speak for everyone, and we are um, all moved. Thank you, again. Um, we do have a panel to join um, Stuart for a short discussion. Um, I appreciate you all taking this time to be here this morning, and hopefully you can stick around um, for the next portion. We will end with a short Q&A, so hold on to your questions. Um, for Dr. Ablon till the very end. Um, so joining Dr. Ablon this morning, we have um, David Hayes, um, <laughs> manager Good and um, mental health clinician from the Nantucket Family Resource Center. Um, Victoria Newstar, program director from Our House. Amy Crew Lyons, chief nursing officer at Nantucket Cottage Hospital. And Sherry Lewis Schaller coordinator of student service and social and emotional learning at Nantucket Public Schools. Thank you all for um, taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Well, so how are we going to kick this off, folks? <laughs> do you want us, the panel, to just take questions from everybody, or how do, you, how do we want this to go? Well, what's interesting <laughs> for me, I'll, I'll start um, again. Once, my name is Victoria Newstar. I'm the program director at Our House, and I'm glad to see that the executive director of Our House is sitting here, coming here to support. Um, you know, all our lives we've heard no Plan B, and today we're hearing yes, Plan B. So I, I think it's interesting because we've had these scenarios at our Our House. Our House is an after-school program. We're here not to replace schooling, not to replace parents, but to provide that support. But the challenging thing that comes to my mind is when we talk about Plan B, maybe at Our House I can implement that, but when we are talking about a school system, we have one adult, maybe two adults to 30 kids. We want to implement let's do it together type. I find that to be the challenge for them. Yes. But here, I guess maybe I'm plugging in our house that we are here for that purpose, where um, if you're finding that your you're rising ninth graders or your teenage um, high schoolers, <coughs> they're not having the time that they need to implement all these great things that we talked about, we're here to help. You know, so I'm here to support the school system. I'm here to support the teenagers and the parents. So Plan B is absolutely something that I know have worked for us. So even though in the outside world, people may hear that term and not <laughs> be able to relate to it, but I think you did a great job at presenting it and I, I do feel that it does work. Well, thank you, and it's good to know that you're out there for a resource because, you know, I think schools are inundated with challenging behavior. And as you say, when you've got one or two teachers with 30 kids in a classroom, it was hard enough when, you know, three of those kids were somewhat challenging. But now, as I said before, if, you know, you may have, you know, eight to ten kids in that classroom who are exhibiting a lot of challenging behavior. Um, and, you know, one of the things we hear from schools a lot is just, I, I, I like this, I love this, but I don't have the time to do it. Um, and honestly, I, I think um, it requires a, a, a shift in resources in our schools because we are, we're spending a, an inordinate amount of time dealing with challenging behavior. It would definitely take less time to try to solve those problems durably than continue to deal with them on a regular basis. But it, 
involve some big shifts in the system, which are especially hard when the whole system is dysregulated. Okay, I mentioned that before. Um, you know, adult dysregulation is a big thing. And in schools, uh, you know, educators are incredibly stressed because, uh, you know, the, the challenges facing them are enormous and, uh, and under-supported at the same time. So. So I'm going to follow up. <laughs> Please. I'm curious how you got other school systems to buy into the collaborative problem solving because of all of the challenges that school systems face that you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, well, so, you know, buy-in is, is uh, it's tough. It's why I, I closed my remarks with that piece about you can't try to impose collaborative problem solving on people. I mean, you know, if the principal of a building thinks this is the greatest thing and is going to try to force it upon people, it will not take. Uh, so generally what we do when, uh, you know, someone in a school is interested is we do some sort of presentation like this and just let the dust settle from it and have the community, the, the educators themselves, discuss it and say, you know, do we think this could be helpful? Do we want to learn more? Uh, and then, you know, the, the big thing in schools, I think, is, um, uh, you know, we, we're not trying to do this, but uh, the system is built in a way that it does a real disservice to educators because um, professional development in schools is mostly what I refer to as spray and pray training. It's like, you know, the last day in August, spray a bunch of training over people while you're setting up your classrooms and trying to, like, come back from summer and pray it's going to take. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's a whole field of what we call implementation science that studies trying to implement things. And if you're really going to, you know, change how it works in a school or anywhere for that matter, you know, it takes more than just a one-time training. It takes um, a lot of intensive training. It takes coaching so that people can say, I, okay, I just learned this stuff. I'm going to go out and practice it, and it doesn't go well. And the next week, I have somebody to talk to about it and troubleshoot it. And it, and it takes creating champions in a building. So there's a whole bunch of things you need to think about. And unfortunately, we don't really uh, do that well. And so what happens is you have this, like, flavor of the year or the administration of this is what we're doing and the next year that's like you know binders collecting uh, you know dust on a shelf of, uh, of the principal or the assistant principal and we're on to something else and we really need to stick with things and do them deeply uh, so if there's interest in a school we then talk about here's what it looks like to do this well and and how can we partner to try to help you do that Thank you. sure so uh, I'm gonna Hi, I'm Amy. I'm the chief nurse at uh, the Cottage Hospital, and I'm also a pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, and as, like Stuart said, I'm, I'm old, so <laughs> as, as I was sitting here listening, and it's not the first time I've heard about uh, CPS, but I'm thinking, okay, well, yeah, I got two of those. I got two of my four kids, and I've used A a lot, right? And then I'm thinking, okay, well, then we have the hospital, and everybody we see at the hospital, and what, do, what are we using at the hospital? And we don't have a whole bunch of mental health services here. And how can we, how can we really use CPS to strengthen what we do have at the hospital? You know, your, your uh, remark is making me think a, a really important point for us all to cover here is I mean, we're in a, a mental health crisis, mm -hmm. a massive mental health crisis. I mean, I was at a speaking event Thursday night where they were showing data that uh, right now more than a third of adolescent girls have contemplated committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Seriously contemplated. More than a third of adolescent girls. I mean, this is a crisis. And one of the things we were talking about, which is true everywhere, and it's got to be especially true on Nantucket, is we're never going to have enough resources so that everybody who's at risk is going to get access to high quality mental health services, despite incredible efforts from people. It's never going to happen. So what do we have to do? We have to put evidence-based practices into the hands of other people. And when I say other people, you know who else I mean? Parents, yeah. teachers, all kinds of people. And we can. So, so and, and not only can we, but you know, the more we learn about the human brain, the more we learn that, like, the skills I've been talking about today, they aren't built, you know, Tuesdays from 4 to 4.50 in a therapist's office. 
to change the brain, you need lots of little doses of skill building throughout the course of the day. Well, who can do that? Parents, after school programs, educators. So it's really, you know, the, that notion of it takes a village. Mm -hmm. It really is going to take a village, but we have to put evidence based practices that support mental health into the hands of the village. Yeah, I, I, and as a, someone who grew up, you know, with the A model and then started having kids and said, okay, yeah, we're going to do this, and we did the sticker charts and everything. And so knowing that I was coming here, I'm going to try something different. My daughter, Jazzy, says, I want to have Kayla sleep over. I'm like, okay, where are you guys going to sleep? Now, if you, if you try to open the door to our bedroom, you can't. <laughs> well, we're going to sleep in my room. Oh, okay. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to sleep on the bed. I said, that's great, but you, there's a lot of stuff on your bed. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we'll sleep on the couch. Okay, but don't forget about the dogs. Oh, yeah, Kayla hates dogs. Okay. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to have to clean my room. I said, I think that's a great idea. Do you, <laughs> do you need help? Yeah, because you know how disorganized I am. I said, great, I'll help you. Fantastic. And, yeah, so wasn't the perfect, right? I was, I was going for that plan, but w we tried it. Well, and what you were doing, though, is you were being curious. You were right. asking a whole bunch of questions instead of making directives, right? Mm -hmm. And 14 bales of laundry later. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> yes, you're, you're, you're up. My name is Dave. I, I work at the uh, Nantucket Family Resource Center. If you're not familiar with family resource centers, they're all over Massachusetts. Every county has a family resource center. We work with the schools. We work with the Department of Children and Families. We provide wraparound services uh, for the community. And uh, one of the big things we do is we work with uh, children from the schools who have been identified as having these challenging behaviors. Um, I was saying to my colleague, Lisa, over there, she's uh, one of our new school liaisons, um, we have the time and space to implement this. And what I loved about your presentation was it just seems so applicable. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter. She's in a Montessori school. I recently got to visit the school, and I realized I had been doing a lot of these things that they were talking about. They're like, oh, what we do is we instruct them, and then we observe. We don't say you're doing anything wrong, and then we say, hey, do you, would you like another lesson? We, we're collaborating with them, even though you know, she's at a, at a young age. I've been a C in an A world. What kind of that really resonated with me, I, just based off the structures of the organization. So I liked how at the end you introduced the idea of that a collaborative approach needs to be within the organization as well. You know, so um, I just yeah, again, I just really appreciate that idea of empathizing, yeah. being curious. You know, one of the things I do is I provide a massive assessment for these families, and it's just a curiosity thing. It's sixty-five questions. They're like. How do you think you empathize as parents with the child? Do you think you both understand the needs of, you know, like it just goes on and on and it, it builds that rapport and that empathy and that ability to kind of uh, come up with a plan because I don't ever want to come up with a plan with someone who doesn't, isn't behind the plan. Well, people are much more invested in plans that they're co-authors of, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think a couple of, you know, important points just to, to go off of here is, you know, one in any agency or organization, school or anything that's trying to use an approach like this, you've got to practice what you preach, Yeah. right? So, you know, leaders need to demonstrate that they, you know, lead solving problems collaboratively. Um, and it's actually in, in uh, one of the books I wrote, it's a big focus of it is like, how do you do this in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, historically, a lot of leaders lead with plan A. And you're not going to get people to do collaborative problem solving if you're, uh, you know, if you're practicing sort of plan A from the top. Uh, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, what I'm really excited about is um, I think about the agencies represented here. And, you know, for instance, if you could get, you know, a, a couple of folks certified in collaborative problem, we have a certification program, certified in collaborative problem solving, you could be, you know, you have local experts here who could be applying it and teaching it to others as well, which would be fantastic. Yeah, you talked about us being uh, an island, and we are an island, so we have limited resources. But, you know, as I was sitting here listening and listening to my colleagues here, yeah, if we could do something that just to start the process would 
Well, and this is why we built our certification program because we, we worked with too many places that we were doing a ton of training and then they'd say next year, could you come do some more training and more training and people run out of time and resources. So what you really need for sustainability is, you know, in-house on island experts who are, you know, the culture carriers and the passionate sort of champions. And, and we've shown we can teach people to do this really well and to teach it to others really well as well, which is how you, you know, really get out in the community. Um, as you were talking, um, I was writing my notes before you even introduced the term CPS. Um, our model is to create a safe place. And so I thought about that. I said, you know, if the safe place is not just for the students or the, the, the child, but it's for all of us. So as soon as a situation presents itself, that's the first thing that we need to focus on. How are we going to provide that safety net for everyone? And so and the next thing I wrote in my notes was doing it together. Yeah. And as soon as you begin to introduce that concept, I said, wow, it, it made me think about an example of a student who just would perhaps just be in places to themselves. Maybe that's not what we were hoping that, that, that they would do. And so in order to redirect them, we said, okay, if you need that space, we'll go with you, you know? Um, that way, we know that they're looking for a place to be alone, mm -hmm. but we cannot afford to keep them right. alone. Yep. So ourselves, we have to be willing to go with them. And so that's what made me think about the challenges because in the school system, that's not always going to be possible to do yep. the, the result that you're looking for, the solution. You may not be able to go with them and, right. and apply that, right. that method. Your, your comments make it reminding me of uh, we did a project many years ago with um, in the New York City schools and um, do, do you all have like um, school resource officers here in your yes. yeah like how many do you have here at in the high school uh, we have one and it's for the entire school community got it so one for this uh, anybody want to guess how many uh, uniformed officers and agents they had in the New York City schools when we were working with them one we have a guess on one. What else? 1,500. 1, Whoa, okay. <laughs> there were 5,500. Yeah. Wow. 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 It would be the third largest police force in the United States of America. <laughs> the cops in the schools. But the reason I'm thinking of this is we found one of the biggest things that would happen is kids would go to take some space to get away for myriad reasons, all kinds of reasons. And before we worked with them, the officers would be walking around to make sure kids were not where, you know, in the classroom, not where they're not supposed to be. And if they saw a kid like in the stairwell, they would, they would say, what are you doing? Get out of here, right? And it would immediately be confrontational. And those kids were already dysregulated because that's why they were there. And it often escalated and kids would get arrested and officers would get assaulted. One of the biggest shifts we had was teaching officers to approach with curiosity and empathy. So to see somebody in a stairwell and instead to be like, hey, you okay? Anything I can do to help? And start a conversation. And there's time then to raise their concern, which is that actually you're not allowed to be here in the hallways by yourself, in the stairwell by yourself. So little shifts like that can be huge. Um, and it sounds like we've got a bunch of resources that could you know, be helpful in the schools to do those things. When you um, decide, like if a, if a district or a school, same in public, if, if um, the school in its entirety wanted to embrace this and start that, what's the typical turnaround time before you actually, I mean, obviously you'll see both on day one, right. bit for part, right? But when you really see the whole picture being yeah. implemented and the effects of it turning things around. Yeah, so the, so the question is about the timeline if a, a complicated system like a school system. And by the way, there is nothing more complicated than a school system. Okay, Be, people used to joke with me when they, they'd be like, um, uh, you all work with correctional systems. Wow, that's really hard work. I'd be like, give me a correctional system anytime. I'll turn a prison around quicker than a school. Um, I really mean it. Because a, a, because a school has to deal with all kinds of challenging behavior with a, a, an unbelievable ratio of like 30 to 1 and teach an academic curriculum at the same time. Um, but your question is how long does it take? So most you know, findings from implementation science will tell you that to implement something with high fidelity, 
in other words, to do it well, and sustainability, so that it's around three to five years later, it's gonna take about three years. Now, does that mean you don't see results until three years? Not at all. You see first res the results in the first six months, the first school year, um, but if you're gonna make it stick, it's gotta go on longer than that, particularly because you have to create a group of champions who are experts, well-trained, and they're gonna carry it on um, you know, once you leave. And, and so you know, when we partner with schools, we, we like to develop a multi-year plan. If people can't commit to a multi-year plan, we say, all right, let's start where we can and get it running. But we know that there's certain elements that have to be in place to make it stick, and it's gonna take a little time. So people uh, you know, who have no training in collaborative problem solving um, can get certified to be a trainer within a year uh, and certified to practice quicker than that. Now, that sometimes turns people off because people are saying like, wow, that's intensive because there's a lot of train the trainer programs out there that you can go to like a two day workshop and get certified and you're now a trainer. This is how things get watered down and don't have any impact. So we're, we're not apologetic about the fact that our process is intensive because when people are certified, they're really good at it and teach it really well. And they then are also a part of a community of people around the world who get together on a monthly basis who are all passionate and experts. And so it helps them stay fresh and learn new things. And so it's intensive because it's robust and effective, honestly. Uh, one of us, I guess, needs to call on people. Um, all right, let's, we'll, we'll go with you. You were the exuberant right out of the gate, so you should get to answer, ask a question. Because you do, you want good, you want good teachers teaching the process. I don't think it's watered down to think, yes, let's put your presentation on Netflix, let's put it on <laughs> Amazon, let's reach the parents who are smart enough to sit at home and say, wow, I've never seen it presented that way. I've never thought about yeah. it that way. Because you talk about changing institutions, we have to change a culture. Yeah. So Gabor Maté and the myth of normal, yeah. you were talking about challenging behavior, normal responses. Yeah. I mean, challenging behavior, behavior is the normal response to abnormal circumstances or a toxic culture. So we're talking about changing a culture in how we raise our children, how we relate to two-year-olds. I think starting in school is too late, but better late than never. We have to have this presentation with this sense of humor and those slides shown to every parent who walks in Nantucket Cottage Hospital for maternal health care. Mm -hmm. We have to have this at the Family Resource Center for every family that comes in to say, gosh, we have this hour-long video. It's only an hour. I don't think that's watered down. So it sees <laughs> the ideas. It begins <coughs> to change culture. What is MGH doing? To get it to get a watered down approach <laughs> out there to the lay people. Well, so first of all, thank you. I love I'm your. Sorry, I'm passionate. <laughs> I'm feeling very strongly. You know, I, I have a regulation you don't, issue. No. <laughs> I, I I hope. Tell you, me more about that. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want to change that dysregulation because um, that's passion um, and it's well placed and 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 you make a great point, which is. You know, in our schools, to fundamentally change the systems in an ongoing way, it takes a heavy lift in things. But you know, that doesn't mean it's all or nothing here. And I can't tell you how many people have told me their lives have been changed, their kids' trajectories changed through some small piece of this. So watered down, you know, that sound makes it sound bad. No, you're absolutely right. We have to get these ideas out there. And what are, what is MGH doing? I mean, we, we are literally putting the uh, finishing touches on a strategic plan right now to try to go from, we reach about uh, 200,000 new kids and families a year. We want to reach two and a half million. Yeah, Netflix, um, Amazon. <laughs> well, look, the reality is- uh, we would be great. You're funny, you're good looking, and it's, it's, it's a smooth presentation. Um, she, she's not related to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but all kidding aside, I mean, one of the things I really do hope is that you all take this and share it. I mean, while I talk about people getting certified as trainers, you know, that doesn't mean you can't teach it. 
until you're a certified as a trainer, go out and share it. And, and you know, I, I did a TED Talk. It's up there. It's on our website. It's out there. You can share that. It's 17 minutes. It's meant for parents. Um, you know, there, awesome, it, we can though. get this out there, and, and we would love your help doing because, so. Because, you know, talk about teaching resistance, the resistance of the culture. Oh. I mean, I, and, and this isn't a boast. It's just to say, you know, you do have certain expectations. I have a son and daughter-in-law who both graduated from Harvard. They have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. It's all conventional wisdom. Yeah. I go to stay with them, and it's painful because of the conventional wisdom. Well, remember, your, your, your kids do well if they can. <laughs> <laughs> okay? They can, they I, I want everybody to know this. I mean, even husbands do well if they can. Like, everybody's doing the best they can. Um, but, but seriously, uh, and then I'm going to take your question here. The other, you know, we, we are also doing some projects in places like Texas that we're going to be bringing to Massachusetts, which is embedding this in collaborative care in primary care practices. I love the idea about, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time teaching parents how to, like, you know, get the baby out okay. But once the baby's there, we don't spend a lot of time teaching people, like, what do you do with it? Right, um, and the fact of the matter is, all kids are going to experience some developmental challenges with behavior. And wouldn't it be great if everybody was front loaded with information like this? I completely agree. I'd You've like been to very come patient around with a microphone. Yeah, she's been. Just, right, she's um, been to, we have a lot of amazing things being said, but I want to ensure that the people who are viewing online can hear your amazing comments. So if you would just take. The <laughs> she's not asking a question now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have. We, yeah, we do, we are, um, okay, also, so that you know, we are recording um, today's presentation. Um, it is, you can view it at, from home on NCTV Channel 8, um, on their YouTube channel. It will also be preserved um, so that we can use this video in the future um, as an educational tool. So we are working with NCTV today to record and preserve. And if somebody wants to ask a question but doesn't want it to be recorded, um, anybody can maybe Absolutely. just share it with one of our hosts and they can ask the question. Okay. So I guess I'd, I love her comment, but my comment was as a parent who is baby stepping. I already know about collaborative problem solving. I use it. I do it. My question is, if you have so many things that you need to collaboratively yes. problem solve, yeah. so say you have 10, 20 in yep. the schools, we're inundated with multiple issues a day. Yep. When do you call the exhaustion point of, okay, every, you know, how long is this gonna take? Are you picking one? Are you picking two? Yep. Are you targeting one problem or are you going, you're just changing everything yep. and doing multiple things so, a day? Great question. So, so let me make sure to answer that. In, in my experience, first of all, most kids, even if they're exhibiting a lot of challenging behavior, the list of, of predictable problems that happens is usually under 10. Now, that doesn't mean you only have five problems a day. You know, one predictable problem could recur many times a day, right? But there's usually five to seven, in my experience, predictable problems that are occurring at home or at school. And you know, your question is, okay, do you take them all and all at once? What, how do you handle this, okay? Um, I recommend when you're brand new to this, you pick one problem to start with, okay? As you get a little more traction, you can maybe have two or three that you are trying to handle using collaborative problem solving, using plan B. So what do you do with the others? If there's seven problems and you pick two to start, the other five, what I say to you is you decide ahead of time, okay, for now, not forever, for now, Everything else has to be A or C, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, it's going to be easier to take things that you're using C for and move them up to do plan B than it is have done a lot of A and then do B. So when possible, do C, drop some expectations, not forever, for now. You're still in charge. You're the one deciding this is plan C to try to cool things down while you focus on one or two. And my other piece of advice, and thank you for your question, because... I didn't have time to address this, is which problem to start with, okay? We make the mistake of going for the problem that is like the biggest, hardest, more fre most frequent. Don't do that. Take a problem, unless you have a kid who's very well regulated, um, it, it, take a problem that is l lower hanging fruit, okay? Easier to solve, going to help you get some traction. 
And often what that means also, by the way, is you inherently already feel somewhat flexible about it. So as a parent, as a mom, you're like, you know what? I, I, I'm flexible about this. I can see a bunch of potential solutions, okay? Something like that is a good place to start. And I will tell you, I've never ever had somebody try this for the first time and be like, I wish I started with something harder, okay? <laughs> never, it's hard enough. Start with something easy, okay? Get a little track record, some success. Then what you do is take something you do in plan C, move it up, take that on with plan B, okay? Okay. Hi, um, my question, or I, I'm just wondering if this program could be pivoted to think humans. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh. Because I think that we talk about neuroplasticity and all of the above. You know, my husband is an educator in the school system. I have an adult child who is living at home and we're working through these things. Um, he doesn't have the outward behavior, but it's the inward behavior. Yeah. But it, the way that I'm receiving this, it, it's all under the same umbrella. Yes. And effectively, it just shows a bit differently. Yeah, um, abso absolutely. I really appreciate you making this point too, because while we've been focused on kids, adolescents, maybe young adults today, let's be clear, every single thing we've talked about ap applies across the lifespan. I just think okay? you have an audience to maybe ch shift this to yes. these humans to get some more draw that, oh, I'm not, I don't have kids at home, I don't, right. you know, to be, a, have a broader appeal perhaps like this. Yeah, so ch if you're interested in, the, in how this applies more broadly, the book Changeable is where I talk about, okay, with your partner, with your spouse, with your in-law, with your boss, with your colleague. Uh, this is people do well if they can. Behavior is determined by skill, not will for all of us. Um, but absolutely, and, and you know, we do actually work, um, even though we're called Think Kids, we do a lot of work in adult community mental health systems. Uh, in adult hospitals, all kind of residential programs, all kinds of places that, that uh, just serve adults as well. Uh, you know, my passion is kids and adolescents, and I also think if we do a better job with them, of course, um, sure. you got it. But thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I have one question for you, Stuart, and I think one question for the for the panel. Great. So. The beaded girl with the diary. Yeah, yeah. You didn't tell us like what happened, so I'm really curious. That was such a cinematic moment. <laughs> um, so if you can share the rest of that, uh, I hope she's okay. But it was very, it, it was a great, great visual. Um, do, do, do what is? Are you now going to ask the panel? Because maybe why don't I address that quickly sure, and then we go to sure, the, the panel. Um, so she's doing okay, which is the good news. Great. Um, you know, she's one of these kids. The moment you meet her. Uh, you're reminded of the notion that uh, somebody's greatest strength is their greatest weakness as well. And, I, and many of you all might work with kids that are referred to as sort of twice exceptional, which have like, uh, you know, the, the sort of talented and gifted, these in kids with these incredible minds. Um, but it's very challenging for them. And as you heard, her, you know, her cognitive flexibility is a real challenge for her. Um, but it's also her, her greatest skill as well. So, you know, she's, she's had uh, bumps um, along the way, uh, but her trajectory is looking up. Um, and I, I gotta say, one of my favorite things is, as I've gotten older and been doing this for a while, is sometimes I'll, I'll hear from these kids when they're not kids anymore um, and see how they're doing in the world. And like uh, just recently, for instance, a kid who was, gosh, one of the most challenging kids I've ever worked with, he was, um, his face was on the cover of Newsweek, I think it was Newsweek or Time, for uh, the face of childhood bipolar disorder because he had one of the first kids who was sort of diagnosed with that, uh, that disorder. Um, and uh, he went to school for video game design uh, and is having a blast designing video games and doing incredibly well as a young, young adult. And people weren't sure if he was gonna um, you know, be uh, in residential treatment for most of his adolescence. So there's some incredible success stories, um, not, not all of them, sadly, uh, but some wonderful ones like that. And she's doing okay. So that's thank great. you for asking. No, that's great. She, um, I feel, yes, I feel like she's just gonna go places. That's how I felt when I heard the story. But my, um, my question for the group is, <clears throat> because I also work at the hospital and had always worked really with older adults, so pediatrics is just kind of a whole new thing for me. I don't have children. 
Um, and one of the things that has really been so striking to me being here on this island is some of the things that I heard parents and children saying as the school year was ending last year, which is very unique to this community, which is, you know, with its huge influx of peak summer population, I think a lot of children feel really overwhelmed by that. And I heard parents using, term, you know, like, the ki my kid feels invaded <laughs> when, you know, streams of tourists and visitors come along. And I do think that, you know, there are a lot of problems that have obviously occur dur during the school year. Um, during the summer, I think kids, you know, expect to have like some space mm. and they, they can maybe regulate in a different way. But I think the opposite is true here and I see some people maybe nodding their heads. So I don't know what the answer is, but I'm putting that out to the panel for yeah, that's, additional thoughts. That's really thoughts. interesting because you're absolutely right. Summer is meant for educators and for students to be less stressful. And oftentimes you see great developmental gains when kids have much less structured environments. Um, and so that's, you know, to imagine that summer is in its own way stressful here for, for kids and for educators and families, a really important observation. I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts about that and, and of course, you know, what might you all, we all do to, to support people in that, with that dynamic. Um, for me, it's, uh, I'm where you are, wanting that to be a point of dialogue because just this week, my colleagues and I, we were talking about how to put Nantucket into perspective. Because when we're dealing with students, the year-round population is so different from the summer population. And so we need to know how is that affecting our students. So I don't have the solution. I'm just saying just this week, it was, it came to our attention that we need to have this as a dialogue mm -hmm. to know how, how do we handle our, pop our, our own population in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think <clears throat> a lot of times it's just about the awareness of it, you know. Sometimes I'll call it upstream mental health care, the idea of, like, being prepared for what's coming. Like, I don't know about y'all, but this March was horrible for me. <laughs> and next year in February, I'm going to put my gloves on and get ready for March, you know, mm -hmm. and be prepared for that, you know, like, uh, and I think that's something that we can make our families, like, be aware of, you know, just talking about something that may seem obvious, but hey, like, how are we going to prepare for this new season that's coming? What are the things you do that help you? What are the things that you do that, uh, that, that hurt, that harm you, you know, that, and how can you, how can you shift, even just shifting your thinking around it or being prepared for it could really help. So I'm really glad that you asked that question, Sarah. Or, or are there, or are there, things that we can create for year-round kids on the island that's a safe space so that they can regulate. That, that can't be invaded. Right. right. Well, and I think one of the things I'm listening, I'm thinking to myself, you got a problem. Sounds like it's time to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and all kidding aside, what you really want to do is you want to resist the temptation for smart adults to brainstorm solutions. What do you want to do? You want to listen hard, the dialogue, listen hard to the kids, hear their perspective, their point of view, their concerns that you're, you're raising. Hear them directly and start collaborating with the kids, co-authors of the solutions, and they'll, again, be much more invested and they'll be much more helpful, I think. So this sounds like an important area for, to, to facilitate discussion around. Oh, and I, I've been wondering if this uh, if you have a training available for adolescents to be leaders to do this kind of peer facilitation, because I can see that yep. helping in the summer, helping leverage the, the people resource that you have that's an issue in every school, right? Um, yep. So that's my question. Uh, it, I'm just shaking my head because the answer is um, not yet, but about to. As part of our plan moving forward, one of the things we're going to be doing is developing curricula to teach this directly. Uh, to kids, both in schools as an SEL approach, but more generally as well. 
Um, so that is, that's a priority of ours. It has been used in high schools, for instance, in peer mediation and things like that, because you can imagine it gives kids the tools to say, okay, uh, you know, here's how I'm going to listen to you. I've got these tools to listen, then we're going to raise your concern. And this can be done in a group setting as well. So um, thank can you for raising we're interested in your in the adolescent approach I mean, yeah i mean it's going to take us a little while to develop it but we if you follow us on social media or just check in with us you, we will be blasting it out when it's uh when it's time there and by, by the way you know there's a lot on the website in terms of we, we run parent classes via zoom that teach this over the course of multiple weeks in groups of parents where you're learning together and practicing so there's a lot to to check out there uh, yeah. Um, I just want to thank, first of all, NAMI and ASAP for finally bringing you here. I know it's been in the works for at least five years that I'm aware of when <laughs> Jack and I met with the superintendent of schools way back when. Um, and I wanted to say from the overall arching information, it's all about connection mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing is, you know, when you're identifying with this uh, collaborative approach, you're inviting the, the child, young adult, whomever to the table so they can be seen and heard. And that's really, for me, um, the most important thing because when we're just looking at the behavior, you're isolating the behavior, not seeing the child. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to work with David and Lisa. Um, I will say he's a good collaborative uh, manager, so I thank him for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, he's, and he's empathetic. Um, you know, I had someone who came to the FRC, as it's known, uh, yesterday that was brought in by Sarah. Um, and, you know, you can look at the circumstance and not at the person and try to problem solve the circumstance. Um, but it is offering the empathy and not the sympathy, which to me are two completely different things. Um, and with that empathetic mind, for me, or standpoint, you know, I could see the person that was there and not his circumstances. And I think with a lot of children, I have two of my own, um, I'm guilty of looking at their circumstance and not really who they are, where they were at that moment. And a lot of it for me was because I wasn't regulated. And down south, sometimes we just call that batshit crazy, but I was <laughs> later informed no, I was not emotionally regulated. <laughs> And so, God you know, in this heart. room, when there was another, <laughs> when there was another um, uh, information session, it was all about the brain. And with a lot of these circumstances, for me, with behavioral health, um, it's very elusive, the behavior. But when I could narrow it down to the brain, it made it more tangible, something I could understand, as you did, the three layers of the brain when you're trying to get and implement Plan B. Um, I don't know how I do that on a daily basis, but I strive to do that. Um, so what I guess I don't really necessarily have a question, but more to the point that, um, as I said to someone yesterday, this isn't going to be easy, but it's possible. And I think for me, um, when I was talking to one of my sons last night who wasn't regulated, and it was at 930 at night, I just said, you know, let's both sleep on it and let's talk about it tomorrow after we both have exercised or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I know I can show up better. Um, and I'll end with uh, this reminding me of a play called um, Our Town. And there's a character in there and she's there day in, day out. And she just says, you, ne you see me every day, but you never really look at me. Mm. And that mm. was so impactful for me. You know, I can see things every day but unless I really look at it more closely I'm not really getting to the heart of what it is <laughs> lastly <laughs> my grandmother lived to be 102 you've got me beat because you said <laughs> your grandparents lived to be 106 so anyway I finally well, have a good pair of jeans because she lived to be 102 thank you well thank you for your remarks and I and look I do I, I do think a lot of this is about connection and uh, and and listening and understanding you know, um, I, I, I think it's really hard for us to listen w while holding back the impulse to just think about how we want to respond and what our reaction is. 
and to suspend that while we really try to listen hard to understand is tough. But the more we practice it, the better we are and at it and the more connection there is and the more regulated people are. So it's worth practicing. I love how excited Dr. Ablon has gotten everyone in this room today. Thank you so much for that. I have time. We have time, I think, to take one more question. Okay. Better be a good one, though. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Right. Hopefully I won't derail us. Um, I was wondering if just in your like research and experience working with schools, if um, like when I think of the skills and the expectations and the challenging behavior, if some of that is also like how we define challenging behavior. Because when I think of a school system and sort of like a lot of it is based on that old conventional wisdom and a lot of school is plan A, like success is based on compliance a lot of the time. And if like, if the expectations are becoming unrealistic, because it seems like a lot of, like they keep, you know, first grade is now third grade and so on. Are you, do you think like if that were to shift that plan B could be more successful? Does that make any sense? It does make sense, okay. yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I th uh, look, uh, plan B isn't magic. Mm -hmm. If expectations are wildly out of reach for a kid or any anyone, uh, given where their skills are, y you're not going to be able to collaborate to make somebody meet expectations that are beyond their reach. So it is really important that expectations be a good match for where people are at developmentally. And I do think that um, over time, we have, um, you know, we've sort of raised the bar of expectations and left less room for variability <laughs> in behavior as well. Um, you know, your comments remind me a little bit of, uh, you know, the best thing kids can do early on is a, a lot of play, um, which is what helps kids' brains develop. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we drive pretty hard academically. And I think this is where educators are in a difficult place because they got to teach the curriculum. And that's how you get assessed. And, um, you know, you may feel like, yeah, I prefer not to be pursuing all these expectations, but you got no choice. And so that's where people uh, get in, the, in, a, in a hard spot. Thank you, Dr. Ablon. Thank you to the panel. Thank you all for coming today and, um, you know, just doing better. <laughs> I commend you all. It's awesome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Wow. Thank that you. That was amazing. Right. Yeah. You're a fantastic guy. Right, yeah, manager. Good manager. <laughs> that's, that's nice to hear. We, I'd love to get my staff trained. Yeah, well, uh, be in touch. Reach out to okay. us. We yeah. would love to have Absolutely. folks certified so here. Thank you. Really nice to meet you. Yes. Thanks, Thanks for your help. Thank nice you. to meet you. I'd love to have you. a chance to work with the hospital yeah. more. Yeah. 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 Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.